Hey guys, Josh here in a brand new, freshly freshly pressed uh, white t-shirt, you know, just like the good old days here. Uh, I just wanted to get that out of the way because, you know, people used to call me white shirt guy and I actually just got an email recently from a, from a viewer of the show and go like, Hey Josh, why aren't you wearing white shirts anymore? I'm, I'm back wearing a white shirt, thank you. But anyways, uh, I had some issues this week. And uh, Big Pod, who, who is here with me today, uh... I think you might be might uh, be able to help me with some of these issues. Really? Yeah, I think so. I think so. So, uh, I so, so as some people might know, uh, a few a few months ago at this point, a tornado came and ripped through my whole town. And uh, <coughs> ever since then, uh, the recovery plan is still very much in progress and still as much of a disaster as you could possibly think think of it as, uh, because you know we're getting scams and everything. But thankfully, my house is fine, so I still got a place to live. Uh, my ISP has to redeploy their entire network, and the, which you know, the fiber optic network that they just deployed last year needs to be basically rebuilt from scratch. Oh, that sucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm actually talking to you today, Big Pod, on the old DSL network because they didn't take that down yet. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> so nice. because I'm back on the DSL internet connection, uh I had to uh you know boot up boot up a good old reliable system in, that I have in my place of a Raspberry Pi that you know runs a DNS server and it runs a squid proxy as well. Cuz you know it's just like make internet a little bit more manageable when you know everybody else is using it. Uh and uh we fire it up. It gets working for about Four minutes at a time and then suddenly I lose internet and then a few seconds later internet starts working again and I'm like what's going on so I'm pinging my local network I'm pinging pinging gateways and stuff is the gateway going down no gateway staying up I'm pinging Google I'm pinging 8.8.8.8 and like what's going on here and I get tinkering and tinkering and tinkering and tinkering. Of course, the cat's walking across the desk right now, but that's fine. Uh, and, you know, I'm... And I just walk into uh, the uh, server closet here, which, you know, has the networking uh, right up on top of it. You know, and I'm just looking at it across all the gears and my seeing activity lights. Yeah, everything's blinking like it should be. And then I get to think of myself... How old is this Raspberry Pi that I'm using this for? And I realize that this Raspberry Pi is still the same Raspberry Pi that I plugged into the server rack four years ago on the same day the local micro center started selling them. And it never left. And it's been fed power for four years straight. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, bear in mind, I'm not doing the fancy USB booting thing with this uh, Raspberry Pi, so I'm thinking that maybe the SD card might be getting a little bad, but at the same time, that wouldn't stop the network network daemon from, you know, uh, rebooting itself every two and a half seconds, which is what I discovered is what the Pi is actually doing. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Now, the Raspberry Pi is running it's running Ubuntu for Raspberry Pi because, you know, that's just what I ha had at the time to install on this thing. And uh, it it looks like querying the journal CTL logs, the network network manager is just randomly crashing and rebooting. Hmm. So uh, we tried distro hopping on Raspberry Pi, and it's and the network uh, networking is still dropping out on it. Like okay, so what's going on here? So we started like querying like all the support forms and everything for the Raspberry Pis, and uh, everybody's saying, "Oh, Pi fours run hot. Pi fours run hot." And I'm like, "That's fine. My my Pi's got a fan on it." And yes, I confirmed the fan is spinning. But what I did not realize is that my server room is not in the air conditioned space that I'm in. It's instead in a completely separate, isolated part of the of the building that I don't really go into. And I didn't realize that there's a 30 degree Fahrenheit difference between where I'm at and where my server's at. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I realized that over the last week, 
That room has been pushing 102 degrees at peak. Because it is not cold right now. And uh, it's going to be even hotter next week. Now, uh, for if uh, for our uh, non-U.S. listeners here, that puts it somewhere around like the 26, 27, I think. 107. 107 yeah. degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. Wouldn't that, that be around 40? It it's toasty. All right, it's toasty. Yeah, let's see. I, I don't know I don't know the conversions off the top of my head here, all right? Okay, I know. 107 Fahrenheit is 41 42 degrees Celsius. Yeah, it's 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 hot and toasty in there. Yeah. Uh thankfully That's I had some really hot. really really hot. Yeah, thankfully so I had some hindsight here and uh, you know, I put a dehumidifier in that room so that way it stays dry. <laughs> so it was a dry environment. <laughs> Right. <laughs> it just wasn't a cool environment. So uh, that door there that's right behind me, I might be getting some holes cut into it before too long. <laughs> just saying. Because uh, it's a little toasty. Yeah. But, you know, it's it's also a it's also a sound dead in space, too. So I had no idea. Because, you know, in, in that server room, because, you know, it's a, it's a sound dead in space. I just have all the fans just run at 100% speed no matter what. So it's like, it's going to be loud anyway. So uh, the, I'm not going to have a noise indicator because I completely eliminated that as a variable. <laughs> it's just that I never actually went to look at the at the uh, run, operating temperature of a Raspberry Pi, which is running at 64 degrees and thermal throttling itself down to the point where it is literally shutting down. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I had some fun with the internet the past week. <laughs> but yeah, uh, in the meantime, uh, after I got that fixed, first place I went was YouTube, and uh, this YouTuber named Eric Murphy. I don't know if you, I don't know if you watch his content at all. I I don't watch it too often myself, but he posted a video today uh, concerning internet privacy, and. It, it is called Caring About Privacy Almost Ruined My Life. And uh, Big Pod, I'm curious. How privacy-centric are you? Hmm. Like, uh, Not... are, are, you, are you all in using, using your GNU slash Linux distro just running Microsoft Windows in a virtual machine? No, definitely not. Okay. No, and you're not running a constant VPN connection, running self-hosting your own Tor node or anything like that. No. I I care about where I leave my footprint, but otherwise, I do not have any kind of insane policies, like running privacy first or whatever. Yeah. Now, uh. I have toyed into this realm a little bit, but uh, not necessarily like in the context of, you know, trying to be private, but uh, because, you know, I've used a DSL internet connection for so long that uh, you kind of just do things like their whole reason why I even initially built the home server was because I got sick and tired of video services buffering. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I have delved into this realm just a little bit myself. So with the self hosting. <clears throat> And uh, I've learned uh, a few things, like uh, you know, I've learned at, uh, getting into uh, Microsoft Windows group policy edit editors and disabling like telemetry telemetry objects of which you can't disable a lot of those anymore, and and such like that. Uh, you know, uh, hard rescheduling yeah. uh, service pack updates and stuff like that. Lighted, I don't use Windows myself, but I've helped other people figure this stuff out. <laughs> So that's yeah. how I picked up a little bit on that. I don't remember. I don't know how to do it on like Windows 10 or Windows 11 these days. But uh, you know, Windows 7. I I think I still I think I can still find my way around that. <laughs> but you know, uh, I've also messed around with like uh, uh, these uh, privacy centric applications such as Signal. Uh, I don't actively use Signal anymore. Uh, I do, I do uh, still still uh, use Matrix, although most of the time I'm not really posting a Matrix anymore, but I'm more of just sitting back and watching. 
Uh, but I don't go as far as like self-hosting my own Matrix server. <laughs> Instead, I just connect to I do. Yeah, uh, I just connect to Matrix.org myself because you know I don't I don't want to I don't want to have to deal with uh, the uh, Synapse server. <laughs> yeah, Synapse server is amazing, but that's in my opinion the standard. It, thing it's amazing for a single person. World. Yeah, it's it's amazing for a single user. No, no, that that amazing <laughs> was sarcasm. <laughs> it's yeah. a pain in the ass to host. Well, yeah, uh, but you know. Uh, I I got to uh I got to like listening to this video and he's saying he he went he tried going down deep in the privacy rabbit hole and uh he he tried talking friends into uh getting rid of Facebook instead of using Signal or you know meeting them in person and stuff so, stuff like that and ultimately he just wasn't successful and he found himself getting socially isolated yeah yeah and that is the cost that a lot of that a lot of these people that uh, you know come come uh, to like my distro hacking streams and they scream privacy 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 you know like well if you're screaming privacy at me first of all you if you're screaming at screaming at me live on the air which you know one person has they're connecting they're connecting through Jitsi and since that runs WebRTC WebRTC to my understanding is not encrypted yeah far I know it's not yeah so uh, privacy is out the window there. And uh, if you're watching the stream, you're probably watching it from YouTube. Which, uh, if you're privacy, if you're privacy focused, you're yeah. you're already on the worst possible platform. Sorry, yeah. Bud. You should watch the restream on on PeerTube, which you know I don't link to that channel very often, but it's available. But if you go to tenleyj.com/contact, you can find it. <laughs> yeah, but even then, at the end of the day, as in my opinion, like the whole idea of privacy first while be being connected to internet is a bit of a funny notion. It really Speci is. Especially if you do things like VPNs, because how private are you really when you use VPN? Well, we talked we talked on this like a couple episodes ago when we were discussing that whole VPN vulnerability yeah. that was found. But uh, like we said, we, we literally... Uh, well, let me see here. Let me grab this. Let me grab this. Uh, so what I've got here is just this random networking cable, right? Yeah. And uh, I'm going to plug it into uh, this little computer that I have here on my desk, right? This computer is not yeah. connected to the internet. Uh, you can't, even though you're running the world's most secure uh, operating system that you could possibly run on it, it's still technically not private. Because it is a hardware device connected to a network. And then that network is going to ping this device to to at least, at the very least, try to figure out where the DHCP server is. <laughs> yeah, as soon as you connect, that device sends out what is known as a broadcast signal. Or broad, yep. uh, it sends out a, a small ping on a, what, is, what is called a bro broadcast address. And that, that, that basically that ping says, where is my DHCP server at? Yeah. When it so, gets uh, that, it then starts talking very much with the DHCP yeah. server. We're talking seven or eight messages between them. And then it has an IP. Yeah, and honestly, like... And if then you wanna... literally, you can literally go and say, this IP belongs to this, this device. And on top of that, since now you're connected to a, a network which likely has internet access, which means that, that now you're basically tr uh, you're basically connected to everything in the world, or like yeah. most of the world, and you're not private at all. And uh, you could be running uh, an, an application in the background known as Discord, which I know some people open up on their computer and they just never close. What's the very first thing that Discord is going to do when it sees an internet connection? Ping, ping the server, ask for, is there an update? Yeah. Uh, Second, it's, it's go first I am all, online. It's not, it, it's not even going to ask if there's an update. It's going to, first of all, try to authenticate your account. Yeah. So it's so uh, it's going to auth it's going to confirm actually, that there's an internet connection with probably a health check ping. Yeah. And then it's probably going to, it's it's then going to qu do an API call, you know, just check to see if APIs match it. That Then it might do the update. And then it'll do the authentication. Go like, hey, uh, is this is this user that I was previously logged into good, right? 
Now, yeah. And the reason why I'm using Discord is because if you're listening to this, you probably have Discord on your computer. Uh, that's actually how Big Pod and I primarily communicate. Even though uh, when we're actually recording the show, we're we're using a different service entirely. But uh, and we have a community on Discord. Now I know that there are private Discord clients you can use, but are they really private compared to you know just using Discord out of the web browser? Yeah, because that is probably the most secure way to actually use Discord. You still have to do pings every so often to detect whether you're logged in, whether you have were there on servers any new messages, whether you have any notifications, whether you have on and on and on and on and on. Yeah, and uh, if you don't have Discord on, on, on your server, but you're on a Linux distro that has a graphical software manager, that gra- uh, there there's probably like a 99% chance that that graphical software manager is going to query an upstream repo repository for uh, updates. Now, I know that th- there are a lot of Linux distros just don't look at that data, but that doesn't mean that's not logged. Yes, because let's be real. As soon as you, unless you do an extremely, extremely, extremely thorough job of se- of doing it in RAM, having your server be extremely, extremely, extremely specifically made to do no logging, poly- no logging, you're going to be doing logs because that's actually a smart thing to do for your maintainer. So yeah, they I mean, know what the hell is happening with their server. And if something goes wrong, they know how to fix it. Yeah. And that's the prime, that's the primary use of telemetry on, on like our podcast feed. Cause I want to see how much data we're moving per episode. So I know, Hey, is it time to upgrade this server or not? Or is it time to yes. uh, g- give Linode some more money? Yeah. <laughs> But ultimately, like, if you're the home user, uh, just take your computer and then just disconnect the Ethernet cable and see how long you last. And uh, you, you just w- once you uh, figure out how long you can last, send us an email at, con- at contact at tuxpace.com and tell us how long you went before you turn the Internet back on. Because <laughs> well, that's really the only way to 100% guarantee privacy. I went one day, but I still was connected to a network. I went My about half one. Week. Technically, I went half the past week, but at the same time, I I had I had a few unread books on the bookshelf to, that I could go through too. Yeah. And I also happened to be working a lot this week, so it wasn't that big of a deal. I w- I went a day because I intentionally unplugged the cable that goes to the to the modem. Yeah, and uh, you know, every now and then it's probably fine to do that because you know. Uh, the, the one thing that you should probably do is, yes, you you should be a little bit privacy con- conscious, right? You, you don't want to have, like, an open tab to Google going 24-7. Yeah. I mean, you probably do, but you don't want to have to if, if you can avoid it. Or, or you know, like Facebook. Like, uh, Facebook watches where the mouse is on the screen, even when it's not the tab in focus. Yeah. So uh, maybe you shouldn't have that tab open 24-7. Uh and you know, uh, it's a great idea. Like, if you can, if you can talk your friends into going out and, and meeting in person rather than you know chatting on Discord, that's great. Because uh, you know, but that's not always I, an option. It, it's like definitely you not and an me can't. Yeah, well, we're on two different sides of the planet here. Yeah. <laughs> and but, even you know, if you uh, are like, even if you're in the same country, even in Europe, that could still mean hundreds of kilometers away. So yeah. But, uh, you know, it, it's it's something that you need to experiment with yourself and just see how, how much you can, you know, not use. Like, uh, maybe not use the Gmail account, but instead use, uh, see, if you, see if looking at, like, that ProtonMail uh, that you're paying $2, that you might want to pay $2 a month for, if that's something that's more in your realm. Or if you want, like, the free option, you can go to Tuda Mail. I think they're calling it Tuda now. It it was originally called Tuda Nota or something like that. Yeah, but uh, they're a free email provider that uh, is privacy focused. It, because you know, securing an email service, while probably not like the most secure thing you could do, it's probably something that's not necessarily not worth it. 
Now, self-hosting the email, definitely not Don't. worth it. Don't. Yeah, because, uh, you know, that, that contact email address took me a few days to figure it out for us. <laughs> and that's just receiving the email. Can you imagine sending? Yeah. <laughs> like, I know how much time it took me to have an internal email address that uh, that I have that is literally on my network and cannot even go out. Yeah, it, it it's not as simple as sudo apt install dovecot. <laughs> no. <laughs> I wish it was, but it's not. And let's remember, like, it took me a day, but let's remember, there is, there is no need for security because it's literally notification emails, it's alerts and stuff like that. And yeah, like, there is no expectation of privacy for me there. there there's no <laughs> expectation for privacy because uh, you or don't security. need it. And yeah. uh, honestly... You're you're really just using it for like your uptime status on like a system. Go like, hey, is this system yeah. up? Oh, it's not up. So I'll, uh, have the monitoring uh, service uh, sent, shoot you an email saying that, hey, this thing's fucking broken. Something <laughs> like that. Yeah, but uh, speaking of self hosting, uh, Big Pod, I know that you run servers and I run servers, yeah. and I know that some of our community might be interested in you know some of the some of the things we do do on our servers. So, uh, Big Pod. Do you or do you not self-host your password manager? No. I Can don't. Can you tell me why? Simple, simple. I really don't see a reason to when Bitwarden is cheap and works exactly the same way if I self-host it or not. I mean, uh, that's the same reason why I don't self-host Bitwarden. So, uh, yeah, it, it makes sense. And honestly, things do things can and probably will happen. It's just a matter of when. Yeah. Because, you know, I had a tornado rip through my town, right? And even though I have this wonderful backup policy, my offsite backup is on biweekly snapshots. It's not going to have the password that I typed in yesterday, most likely. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know... Uh, so do I really want to self-host my password manager? Because uh, my pass, I I checked uh, my Bitwarden account. I have over seventeen hundred entries in that. <laughs> That's passwords, past phrases, past keys, uh, authentication uh, tokens, and all kinds of stuff in in that Bitwarden. Now I'm of course I'm using the Bitwarden free tier. Uh, yeah. So, but you know, uh, I've been thinking every now and then, just like maybe I want to toss them that ten bucks a year. Yeah, it's yeah. Che- uh, I said it's cheap. It, it I, is cheap. On the hand, I have like 200, 200 elements in there, but I also re- pretty much keep it. Uh, keep only passwords in there. Yeah, uh, you're you're not like you're not being me and putting like SSH keys into it for like random no. stuff. Yeah, no. Completely understandable. Uh, what about? Uh, of course, uh, I I personally think that there is some value in like a partial backup strategy that you would self-host. Yeah. Now, uh, of course, this this uh, touches back on the privacy subject that we were talking about earlier. But like, uh, in in a perfect scenario, you follow what's called a three two one backup policy. That's three types of media. Uh, two forms of redundancy, and then one offsite. Yeah. Now three. So let's use like a music CD as an example, right? You have the CD. That's one type of media. You put it onto your. You put it on. You rip it onto your computer. Now you have two kinds of media. Now, what's your third? Uh, depending on on how your how you're storing on your computer, I would go with. The, the other way, if you're if you have a SSD, we go with a mechanical hard drive. It it could be a mechanical hard drive, or you could you could uh, b- reburn music onto what's onto a data CD, you know, as like a optical media. Because you know, uh, while uh, the claims of how long a optical disc can last in storage is a little dubious at times, for stuff like media files. 
uh, you, you for one thing, you can actually store a lot of just music files as raw data on a CD compared to like burning them as audio tracks onto the CD. Whereas a, a typical CD is like 700 megabytes of storage. And if you're putting, and if your average song duration is like three to four minutes, and you're encoding that into into like an MP3 uh, container, that's uh, three or four max, about a minute yeah, that, per meg. Yeah, so you you got about uh, three or four megabytes. Think about how many songs you can actually store on a CD. About two hundred. Yeah, that that's a lot of songs. So uh, you yeah. that that can count as another as another form of archive now. Two copies of the data. That's one copy on your physical computer. That's another copy on another computer. That's what that means. At least one of those should should be offsite. Then offsite doesn't mean well uh, two kilometers off-site's away. Ne- offsite's next. Yeah. But uh, ideally for these computers, in in an ideal world, you have one computer on one corner of the house and one computer on the complete opposite corner of the house. Yeah. Now, I know that's not practical. I know it's not practical, but that's the ideal. Yeah, because your final backup stage is the offsite backup. Now, and this is the one that get that can get a little dubious, and also this is the one that might actually cost you money. But this is the locality you have to define locality because yeah, in in simplest term that would be so far away that if if some sort of localized disaster hits, it's not there. So. We're talking kilo, um, many 10, 50, 100 kilometers away. Yeah, so like uh, if Big Pod was willing, I would use his server as a backup of my server yep. in an ideal world. Now, uh, of course, that's going to take many hours and many days of uploading, so probably not going to be worthwhile. But that, you know, that's, uh, the, that's the disaster of if a meteor strikes. Yeah, that's that, the kind that's of the, dis- <laughs> the kind of locality yeah. we're speaking of. Now, uh, you don't have to be that extreme, but you know, the next town over, yeah. not a bad choice, not a bad choice, or even better, the other side of the country, unless or, the country know, is as small as mine is, where basically, basically, uh, I can go within the same day, and yeah. I'm not talking about. Within the same day as in morning, uh, morning and evening, I'm talking about same day as in, in couple of hours. Yeah, and of course that's if you're wanting to self-host the backup. Yes. There is another option. This is the option that can cost you money, and that's called the cloud providers. This yeah. is where this is where companies like uh, rsync.net, Backblaze, and and, and them. And really, any kinda- cloud provider. Yeah, come, come in. Uh, well, yeah, Google Drive, uh, Apple, S3. Apple iCloud. What, which you know, those those are the ones. Apple iCloud and uh, Google Drive are like the the consumer facing ones, as like the cloud providers. We could touch on those next. Yeah. But uh, if you're using them, if you're using treating these as like your offsite backup, that's fine. And uh, there are many tools that can actually directly <coughs> connect to those services and take all your data encrypt it so they can't scan it and put it on to put it onto their thing so uh Encryption stuff like you know, rest. yeah so stuff like uh rustic backup or duplicati i think it yeah. is or duplicity yeah. one of them is it's like the old deja dupe util- utility use it uh and i know uh borg kind of can connect to uh these cloud providers like uh you know uh, Google Drive in them, but you need to like mount it as like a storage volume on your computer to be able to do that first reliably. Because uh, Borg only connect can only work through like SS uh, local network connections, so like SSH, FTP, and, and stuff like that. But it can't quite connect through like an S3 cloud. I mean, I imagine that there's a way you can do it though. I just haven't taken time to figure that out. But uh, that's backups. Uh. Now I I'm going to tag this as accessible cloud storage, and uh, Big Pod, you probably know what I'm talking about. I'm talking yeah. about like should you self-host Nextcloud and actually use it as the cloud. Now uh, mm-hmm. Nextcloud is a massive project, and it has a lot of things. So uh, let's just talk about this from the standpoint of file sharing. So if I upload if I put a file up on if I want to put a file up on the cloud. And share it with you. 
Should I open Nextcloud to the internet? Yeah. I guess. Depending on what's your threat model. Do yeah, you... that... But that's the question of privacy and of security. What is your threat model? That's the, that's the question you need to ask yourself all the time. And you should ask yourself that repeatedly even after you deploy. Yes. You're like, do I want to maintain this is actually yes. really what you want to be asking yourself. But you should always be analyzing the threat model because, you know, uh, I there are some businesses in my, in my area that actually do deploy NextCloud because, you know, a crappy internet connection. So uh, they were thankful that uh, I have an ISP that's a baller and willing willing to help pe- people set this up with on a contracting basis. But uh, uh, a lot of these places want their next clouds to be publicly available so they can connect to them outside of the world or you know uh, share share it uh, via contact link. And uh, he takes a very hard stance of no because uh, what happens when next cloud gets compromised? Yeah. Well, if you're if you're a business and your and your business is using Nextcloud, that can be a pretty big deal, especially when your Nextcloud is not continuously updated like it should be. Yeah, <laughs> but that's that's your that's your standard DevOps issue, site yep, reliability that, issue. Of, you should yep. always keep things updated. Yeah, so that's uh, why automatic updates are good. Yeah, automatic updates are good for uh, you know keeping that patched. But uh, now, Google Drive, iCloud, Office 365, they work. I mean, if you're if you're willing to to uh, hand those companies money, or uh, just willing to deal with the privacy implications of using those companies, they do work. And honestly, that's what I would recommend if you're actually wanting to share files with people over the internet. Now, uh, there is no there is no real issue with doing it through Nextcloud. But uh, the way that I would personally treat Nextcloud is I would just spin Nextcloud up on a VPS, and that VPS Nextcloud cloud's only purpose in life is to share those files I put onto it, not put for me to put everything onto. Yeah, because you can federate Nextcloud. Yeah, and uh, so uh, it it can make that pretty easy once you figure out how to federate Nextcloud, which that took me a minute. <laughs> <laughs> but uh that and then you know there's all the other things that nextcloud does which is honestly like the bigger appeal for nextcloud for me stuff yeah. like uh s- setting up gpotter with nextcloud because uh you know gpotter.net is an amazing service and it's a classic service from like being able to keep multiple multiple uh, devices and all these open source podcast clients in sync with each other. But gpotter.net, the server, has not had open signups in almost seven and a half years. But thankfully, Nextcloud has a plugin you can install to sync gpotter. Of course, BigPot's going to look this up now. Yeah. Because you know, every single time I've ever went to try try to sign up on G Potter, not been available. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't even know if the I don't even know if their sync server is even up anymore. But it is still very much an open protocol because it is in, it it is a podcasting standard protocol. But it's a plugin for Next Slide you can set up, and it works pretty well. It it won't save like your exact playback position, but it will at least. But because, you know, I don't necessarily pause podcasts, I just let them play. And uh, I just let them play until the end of the episode, then I stop. Uh, it it works great for, like, my personal use case. It, it's also great for, like, calendar sync, which, uh, you know, uh, I know that GNOME Calendar has direct support for it, but we're, we're talking about, like, being able to sync your Microsoft Outlook calendar. You can sync that with NetCloud. Yep. Yeah, uh, through, through uh, the QDAV. Uh, applications or even like the local calendar application that already comes pre-installed on your smartphone or even your uh, I, uh, Apple Apple's internet phone. And or on our hand, like our one that's great, it's if you are used to web clients for your email. Yeah, it, it's useful for all that. Which uh, and uh, those are like two reasonable things for me. 
But of course, the biggest thing for me for Nextcloud, note sync. Because Nextcloud yeah. notes, very solid service. A lot of the clients might be a little bit lacking, but I'm a big fan of the QO notes. <laughs> I've actually been delving it way into more. I, I've actually taken the time to take my to take uh, a super massive, massive uh, uh, the Dungeons and Dragons campaign notes that I had from that I had all packaged up into a single Emacs org file. And uh, this thing was massive. Like the org file itself, the text file was over was almost a megabyte in size. Just a plain text file. So uh, it is not it is not a small document. I I I did have to break it up into Nextcloud, otherwise it was just going to be very 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 slow to load. But uh, the way that it, the way that it organizes notes and everything in Nextcloud, it makes sense in my head brain. Yeah, and well, of course, I no- haven't yet d- dived into all that, but I, if I would ever go into like serious note taking, which I probably should, I would need something that I can sync between multiple devices, and multiple types of devices, really. Yeah, and because you know it's it because it's notes, you probably want to be you, and uh, your privacy focus, you probably might want to self host that sync. Yeah. Now, uh, the big benefit that Nextcloud Notes has for me specifically is that when I'm typing on my, on the notes on my phone, I can see that the that same entry being added onto my Nextcloud. So if I'm on the if I'm on my Nextcloud web uh, page in the web browser, I can see it being entered. If I'm on my if I'm on my Note client on my desktop, I can see uh, it might not update as fast, but you know every five seconds I'll just see a block of text just appear yeah. on there. And it's like this is what the, this this is what I wanted. <laughs> In past, I've used OneNote, which is a Microsoft solution, and yeah, but yeah, it's like and it's very much tied to their cloud and all that. So yeah, there there are open source alternatives for OneNote that try to that try to port that functionality, but yeah. uh, honestly, they're they're not impressive enough to uh you know be like the one-to-one replacement but a couple of them do come kind of close but they don't really support the syncing and then of course if you're a big photo taker the next the next cloud photos uh while yes there are some issues with it uh it it is it is in the range of not bad (laughs) yeah (laughs) And of course, I also use it for like cookbooks too, because uh, there's a cookbooks plugin that that will save all your cookbooks in, in like Nextcloud Notes, and uh, it presents it pretty well. So I've got all. So I've got in this room next to me, I have my grandma's, I have my grandmother's entire cookbook uh, library, and my grandmother was an Italian chef, like professional Italian chef. So, so she has a collection, and I've been, I've been typesetting this collection into my next cloud, on a very slow basis, yes, but it's getting entered. Cause heaven forbid, I want to be able to go into a search bar and type and type in how do I want to cook my lasagna today, <laughs> rather than you know flipping through seventeen different books to find a single lasagna recipe. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, a, let's make it a little bit more convenient while my phone beeps in the background. <laughs> and there is another category people people at least wanted to and still might want to uh, want to self-host social media. Yeah, social media. Now, uh specifically when you're thinking about social media, you're thinking about like Facebook and Twitter and all that. So, what you want to be self-hosting is a federated platform like Mastodon. Yeah. It doesn't have to be Mastodon. It could be something like a Pleroma, but honestly, the most popular one is Mastodon. And I don't, I am really, really don't, I don't want you to do it. Like if you want a more, more deeper dive on why, why you shouldn't be self hosting it, check out my YouTube channel. I have a video on that, but you really don't self host it unless you're, 
unless you're really into self-hosting and want to maintain a, shall we say, a very, very horribly, horribly for self-hosting application. Nothing but trouble. Yeah. And of course, we we touched on Matrix earlier, so... Uh, same same it, problem. Yeah, it... Why is it that self- all these federated, primarily federated applications give trouble when it comes to hosting them? Uh... I would always think that the, a lot of them tend to take a privacy first uh, approach and uh, they're, they're also written by people that uh, don't really know how to code these things prior. Because the, the, big the biggest issue with the Synapse server is that it's single threaded. Yeah. <laughs> that's the biggest and, issue with it. <laughs> and it's, uh, it, that's not its biggest issue. But how it works and how, how it, like the whole how it works is also bit of a pain in the ass but it's also yeah. a bit a bit because of how matrix works so yeah yeah and now, when it comes to Mastodon, it's ruby so say goodbye to the ram yeah uh goodbye ram here's here's the, here's the dedicated map here's the dedicated matrix box here's the dedicated Mastodon box they do not run on the same box at all yeah <laughs> I did uh, run them so, the sep- same box, but it wasn't a small box. Now, if you want a nice, easy thing to self-host, though, self-host a blog. Yeah. I'm, and I'm talking about, like, a static site blog. I'm not talking about, like, your WordPress. I'm talking about, let's let's start fire up a VPS. Let's install, like, our favorite web server, whether it be Nginx, Apache, Caddy, or whatever the heck is popular these days. And then just point uh, slash var slash www and just drop an index.html file into there. Yeah. And uh, not only do you, uh, yes, that that is a very basic website. Yes, I, I understand. But, uh, you know, I think that if you want something to just like get you into self-hosting and you want and you want to have a sort of uh, social media media profile that you can just link people towards. A basic, a basic blog, probably perfect for that. Yeah, and you can get a little fancy with it with like the static site generators, but uh, I do think that there is some value in learning how to write a single HTML page. Yeah, uh, on the same note, it could you could also do a simple uh, f- front page for yourself or or resume page. Basically that. Basically, yeah. what I mean is like, where where you worked, what are you doing, so on. Such things, or, they are pretty easy. Such such a thing is pretty easy to host and can be actually a good entrance into self hosting. Because yeah. nginx, I don't know, they is the is the root of all self hosting. It kind of is. Uh, like it started with NAS for me, but uh, when you want to get real fancy with the self-hosting, that's when you that's when you figure out Nginx. And yeah. of course, uh, if you're like a YouTube stream or a YouTuber or a streamer, and you looked at like that Linktree website that wants to charge you uh, fifteen dollars a month just to have a bunch of links on a web page, this is a much cheaper alternative. That's really easy. To, I don't know how how they can even sustain it because. Really, like, people should be able to like hire somebody with very basic knowledge but in Big programming. Pod, websites are hard. Yeah, but pay somebody five bucks and they're gonna make you one. It's not like it's rocket science. It's it's literally literally buttons and nothing else and a picture <laughs> and a background. It's literally most basic things you can get and all that can be defined with a very simple file or, or really a really a single file everything else can be very simply simply defined and to host like pay a, pay a guy like 2-3 bucks and they're gonna do it like it's not actually that that 
hard to do. It's a it's a static site. It should be a static yeah. site. I ideally it's a static site unless you want to get really fancy with it for absolutely no practical reason. <laughs> well, only reason it wouldn't be a static site is if you need it to have some sort of backend. But why would you want it to have a backend? Please. You went to learn how to make one. Still. <laughs> learn how to make a, a static site with something like, I don't know, Blazor, JavaScript. Well, yeah, uh, Rust. Uh, make a static page in Rust with WebAssembly. There you yeah, go. There you go. A very complex uh, skill you you need, you might want to learn, but you still get a static site at the end. Yeah. Now that we're talking about things that you probably might want to consider not self-hosting. I want I want to talk about something specifically that should probably self host. No, not should, must. Yeah, you must. Yes. And why must you? Because uh, if you don't self host this, you're doing it wrong. Just Very say Very wrong. You're doing it wrong because if you you because we're talking about home automation now, right? And uh yes, I know that Alexa exists. iCloud exists. Or and uh, Google Home exists, but they got nothing on a well set up home assistant. And all of them should talk to your home assistant. Most of them do talk to your home yes. assistant, <laughs> just and, out of the box. And in general, if you, we we talked about uh, earlier, we talked about threat models. The, 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 yeah. These trips, all of the threat models you can think yeah, of. Yeah. If you're using, it, you know that little uh, doorbell camera that you got right there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You probably shouldn't be connecting that to the to the open yeah. internet, no matter who who that provider is, because you know a ring. Because uh, you know when here in the United States, at least, when Mister Police Officer wants to get that camera footage, he doesn't. It and he sees that you got that ring doorbell camera. He doesn't have to ask you for the footage. Yeah. <laughs> Now, uh, of course, I'm talking about like home automation. Like, say you open your door and your lights turn on and stuff like that. You don't need yeah. to go down that rabbit hole. Or you not, you not... go, you come home, you connect to Wi Fi, and, uh, and, and, and your lights porch light turn comes on, on, and yeah, I don't yeah, know, yeah. TV starts playing on your favorite channel, and so on. Yeah. Now, uh, you don't have to go super deep down a rabbit hole like some people do. Because uh, the way that I treat it, is I do use Home Assistant. What does Home Assistant do for me? A lot of times, I uh, when you know uh, I actually get it back up and running on the servers because you know it's not running right now. It tracks the 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 temperature of the the various temperatures around around my home because you know uh, I'm curious as to what room is getting like cooling, what room is not, and uh, should I like you know open the server room door, which I've been procrastinating this year. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't even have a home assistant uh, anywhere or anything like that. And yeah. that's for a now, simple reason. I don't have any smart home automation things or smart home things at all. Well, you you might not right now. But, you know, when when you decide when to I do, up the home... That's the now, first thing I'm going to do. When, when, but uh, you, all, you don't even need any of the, any of the devices either. Because if you install the home assistant... On a server, you install the Home Assistant app on your Android device. Now you have location tracking that you're self-hosting. Yeah, 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 and that's real nice. I've used uh, I've used for that exact reason. Yeah, I now, was actually okay. I was doing something very specific. I was turn. I was executing commands when I came home, and yeah. that was for a very specific thing. Because when I came home, I opened the door, and my phone connected to the Wi-Fi, and my computer turned on. Yeah. That was all and... it did. And I had weather on it. Uh-oh, Kat, what are you doing? Pressing buttons, I guess. Yeah, she's she uh, rolled and rolled onto the keyboard and hit buttons. Okay. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, I gotta collect myself. But... Uh... The, the one thing that I learned really quickly with Home Assistant is that if you tie a bunch of those old school heaters uh, into a Home Assistant where, you know, you just set them to high and and then uh, connect them to a smart plug that Home Assistant can control, 
and then pair per pair a temperature probe and you set that up across and you just want to want to keep your entire home to a certain temperature setting you can have yourself the most comfortable uh heating experience that at least i've ever experienced <laughs> lighted uh here in america our homes are built out of sticks and you know we have this foam insulation some of our houses are awful drafty <laughs> but at the same time that's because you know wood's cheap <laughs> but uh and then you know I don't want to. I don't want to run like my porch light on twenty four seven like some people do, because I just think that's pointless. So when I when I pull into the driveway and my phone connects to the Wi Fi, turns on the porch light. You know, sometimes think. I get home. Sometimes I get home a little late, and sometimes I forget to turn the porch light on on my way out. So when I get home, I at least want to be able to see see the le- the lock I'm putting my key into, rather than you know bust out the phone, hit the flashlight button, and hold it up. Well, I, I press this little <laughs> button besides on the wall in front of my house where it turns on the porch light. I mean, we can do that too, but uh, I don't have one of those buttons. <laughs> I have it. Yeah, but I do have these smart light bulbs. <laughs> I don't have that either. Ah. But, you know, uh, wh- when you're living in, like, a small apartment complex like mine and you're getting that Amazon delivery package and the Amazon driver doesn't can't tell which unit is yours, you can uh, – I have – my uh, porch light is actually an RGB light bulb. So I just uh, flip flip it to rainbow rainbow puke mode and I tell him, <laughs> go to the RGB light bulb that's puking rainbows right now. Yeah. He's like, oh, I know exactly where that is. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, – you can do a lot more with Home Assistant too. Yeah, a lot more, and it is probably the biggest rabbit hole you will go down, should you choose to go down that path. Yeah, home automation is pretty interesting. Like watching yeah. some YouTube channels that do this stuff. Like even just as a side thing, it becomes it. It looks a real rabbit hole, and especially yeah, and- with the today's advent of AI and things like GPT-4 Omni and stuff like that, you can be pretty, pretty interesting what you can do. Yeah, and uh, it, if it was still around like Minecraft, that company, uh, I, they don't operate anymore, but when, when they were operating, you could set up like a voice assistant that would interact with your home assistant. So you could go like, hey, Minecraft, turn the lights on. Yeah. Which, you, you know, you can do that with the Google ecosystem and the Apple ecosystem. And I think uh, Home Assistant is working on, like, their own native voice command solution. Uh, I don't know if it's actually out in any release builds yet, but they're working on it. Or at least they said that they were. But, of course, Big Pod, there is one thing that we self-host for this show. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that is yeah that that is our podcast platform, which uh, yeah. if you're going to be running a podcast... You might want to consider self-hosting your own podcast. Yeah, I know. At some point, the podcast providers will tell you that you should probably be self-hosting your podcast. Like you know, it, some some podcasters have found out fairly recently. I'm not going to list any names, but you know, they're they're not small shows. Mm-hmm. But there is value in self-hosting the podcast because that that marks you as a true independent journalist or a true yeah. independent content creator. We are not subject. To the, to the YouTube guidelines on, like, content guidelines. I don't care if we get demonetized on YouTube. Yeah. Because uh, you, YouTube is not our primary uh, platform. Yeah. And even, even, you, even YouTube can't really demonetize us for the need to monetize us. Yeah, yeah. Please subscribe. Uh, yeah. Uh, we can't get kicked. Even though you might be able to find us on Spotify, Spotify does not control our feed. Yeah. Amazon does not control our feed. Yeah. Apple does not control our feed. You know who controls her feet? Actually, it's me more than him. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I I just pay for the box. (laughs) But yeah, uh, and of course, like like we've said repeatedly, guys, this is not free free to host. Uh, at the same time, you don't have to pay as much as you know I'm paying to do this. Yeah, I'm just paying to do this because I don't want you, the, the listener, to have a bad experience at you know going to the episode and downloading it and future proof in... and we are future proofing a bit yeah let's just be honest bit. yeah that's most of what it is just future proofing because heaven forbid i'm going to hit i'm going to forget to hit that resize button 
Yeah. I just know it. <laughs> but uh, you can do this for as little as $2.50 uh, per month. Yep. And that is a single CPU core with like 500 megabytes of memory. And, all, and that's more than enough for your small podcast. Now, probably yeah. cast a cast Maybe a pod. Not with my, cast a pod, but yeah, not with cast a pod. But realistically, what is a podcast but an XML file? Yeah, <laughs> all you have to do is just learn, learn find... how to craft that XML file. You can do it with basically no resources. Yeah, and enough it... to run enough to run the what is it called an nginx and a and for it to actually output a file. Which you can put together yeah. with your blog or your or your front page. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, that is something that you might want to go down the rabbit hole of. Because, you know, writing writing XML, it's, horrible. it's an ancient, ex- it, it's horrible and it's an ancient experience. Yes. But it's also quite enlightening, too. Because uh, if you don't know anything about programming, XML is at least going to teach you at least uh, formatting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, uh, speaking of which, if you guys want, if uh, we are looking for ideas on how to fund us, because you know I don't want to do like the the merch thing, because if we do the merch thing, I'm gonna want to I'm I'm gonna want to have distribution control of the merch. I don't want to pay like a Teespring, because yeah. I don't like Teespring's <coughs> T-shirts and their coffee mugs are horrible. And you would want to do if, it right. Yes, if, if we're gonna have merch. I want to have a good coffee mug because it's one that I actually want to use, right? And I'm not happy with Teespring because they they just do a simple print process over the mug. No, we, we want to do this right. I want to use a dye sub, sublima, sublimation printing process on the coffee mug, which I know that sounds weird, but you can do that with ceramics. Now, and that's why I don't want to do like the physical merch thing. We can do the Patreon thing. I guess, but I don't want to have to put in the extra effort to do the Patreon thing supposedly right, according to the people that tell you to use Patreon. I don't want to do like Patreon exclusive stuff because I don't want, I don't like the idea of putting anything behind a paywall. <laughs> there might be, there might be an option for us to put things behind paywall, but we're not yeah, there yet I... because we don't have ads currently. If we yeah, had we... ads, we, we would release a premium, what's called premium. RSS feed for those of you who paid, but guess what? You don't have sponsors. <laughs> that and you know, uh, we we don't have sponsors. We don't have the, we don't have anybody that wants to be a sponsor with us. We're not even getting the scam sponsorships yet. <laughs> We're actually not getting them, which I'm yeah. happy with because you know I'm still getting them on my on my proper channel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, you know, uh, send us ideas for the funding. Uh, that's. That's what I want to know. It's just like yeah. I'm not completely opposed to, to uh, you know, like the, the crypto, the crypto coins. But I am. Which, I, yeah, he is. But you know, I, I want to know. That's really what it is. But in the meantime, guys, I think you can catch us next week. Yeah. Uh, before before we go, don't forget oh, right. you can you can send us an email at context at tagspace dot com. Did I say that right? I think you said that right. Uh, Is it right uh, on the screen? It should be on the screen by now. Oh, I'm, okay, I'm, okay. But by the by the end of the podcast, I might actually remember the email. And hey, what do you know? If if you want to contact us, uh, Discord is an option. But if you want to contact us directly, you should be able to, you should be able to see on the screen if you're watching the video or in the show notes. And descriptions she she see the see the links to our Mastodon accounts where you can where you can ping us via public wall or send us a private messages. Yeah, or you know, uh, the show itself actually does have a federal federated feed for Mastodon, so you can follow the show yeah. from your Mastodon profile. Uh, so, and that is just simply at nta at tuckspace. Or at show.tuckspace.com. Yeah. Yeah. Something something like that. But uh, you, you can follow us directly from the Mastodon profile. So every time that, you know, we post we post an episode, you can get that notification on your Mastodon. I would like yeah. to see if we could, like, uh, you know, 
cross post that to Twitter at some point, but uh, I'm not that concerned about it right now. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see you guys next week. See ya. Goodbye.